first Peter was it? Yeah, first, second Peter one nine. Second Peter one nine. God's not willing any should perish. And they go, Oh, you see, that's true. Well, it is true. But you know who he was applying that to, don't you? To those in Christ. Just like he told Abraham, of your seed, I'm going to have a promise. You can see how the same statement could be made, but misinterpreted, and look where that led Abraham. It's doing the same thing for church sanity. Keep on misapplying what that verse is talking about. It has nothing to do with everybody else you wanted to apply to with the whole world. No, no, no. To those that are in Christ. That's the context. That's the audience of 2 Peter chapter 1. That's the context. But yet people want to take it and bastardize it and say, no, but God said, I, no, 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 you said what you think God said. God said he's not willing any should perish. And in the context that anyone he's talking about are those that are in Christ, not living like a fool. It's the same book, 2 Peter, that talks about people who are apostates, who are made merchandise of, and similitude to the angelic host who were made, who made merchandise by Satan. Again, don't believe me. Read the book. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and chapter 2, he talks about that. What a coincidence. But I'm wrong, right? God's wrong. Even though he told you in the flow of the context of the writer Peter, I'm talking about my own kids going the wrong way and how I will, I will then destroy their body of flesh. They will pay a price in Hades or Gehenna. It's not funny. They'll pay a price in the lake of fire as a portion. I don't want any of them to have that. That's what he's talking about. But yet, people get it all out of back to front, just like they do with Abram. They do the same thing. Was Abraham a good guy? Yeah. Did he just fight a battle with four kings and kick their butt? Yeah. He just honor Melchizedek? Yes. Did he follow God's will all the way, except for that lie about Sarah not being his uh, wife? Yeah. Yeah. He was doing pretty good. He was doing pretty good. God made a covenant with him that was now in blood, making it a testament. He's doing pretty good. Then all of a sudden he goes, okay. Uh, 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 in my thing, uh, uh, my thing, uh, it's filled with Hagar, okay. He knew doggone well that was wrong. I, I don't, I, if I see, not if, when I see Abraham in heaven, I know doggone well if he's able to recall the situation you, <laughs> like it's supposed to be, there's no way he's going to go, yeah, I, 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 I meant well by that. N no, you didn't. He, he's going to know, he, he's going to know straightforward. He's going to confess if he's able to do such. He, he's, he'd probably laugh about it at this point. He'd probably say, Oh my gosh, how foolish was that? I knew he meant me and Sarai because he brought us out together. And I knew that that's what he's talking about. He, I, I knew that because I knew the one flesh thing. I knew the whole marriage thing. I, I just was selling, I was selling, I was buying my wife was selling that she was too old and she had no more of her cycle left to have any kids. I bought into that narrative that physically it made sense that she couldn't have any kids. So, I mean, uh, uh, there was no other alternative. That's what he was really thinking. That, that's the truth of the matter. He saw the physical rationalization to it. Just like people who read 2 Peter 1, 9, they go, they see the majority view of it, and they see that it makes sense. Well, God loves everybody, so therefore, well, your, your premise is wrong. It's like, just like Abram was like, well, that is my seed. No, 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 no. It's the seed with your wife, with your wife. You left that last part out. Just like when you say, God will any should perish. You're leaving the part out about the context, who he's talking to. You, you can't just leave out the rest of that process of thought. Because Abram did that. Look where it led him. Strife forevermore. And by the way, is there strife evermore between people who believe in the church in any way what I just mentioned about that verse and people like us? Yes. Because they don't want to believe the truth. Because they continue to believe what has been sold to them as a narrative that's in books and in sermons. I can't help the fact that you've been sold out of the river by your sin and flesh. But it doesn't make it right. It's wrong. I understand it, but it's wrong. And I was there too once. We all are at some point corrupted by our sin and flesh in our faith because of the propagation of just how Satan has sown leaven in there. It's what he's done. It's part of the process. But I digress into those things. But back to Genesis again, as we end up at our, I wanted to go through just a couple of chapters here. Uh, I, the intention was to get through uh, just 1 through 12, but then stop there. I had a little bit of forward here up to chapter 15. I wasn't going to go that far, but I just did. But then, then in this case, just to kind of reflect back on this, why is all this important, and why am I saying all this? Because the Genesis gems and the, and the template that's being laid down and the multi-layers of understanding that come from the book are massively huge in understanding what you read in God's Word everywhere else. You say, what do you mean? Well, the principle in, in Genesis 1 is look for hidden truth that's in, 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 the, in the open space. Look for the hidden truth that God is 
leaving out in the open when he said, he created heavens and the earth, and the earth became void. And you say, well, that's not what my version says. Okay, that brings up a second point. I understand there's multi-layers to what words mean beyond what you see in English. Number three, I understand that it's what God says, and, flow, and when you flow with that thought of what God says, it changes what you hear and read other things say. Understand that. If you start understanding that it wasn't a creation account, it's a restoration account, now the view's different, isn't it? Instead of a, new, instead of a beginning, it's a new beginning. It changes the narrative, because now you're thinking of not origination, you're thinking of a restoration that has a different mindset involved. And you're starting to see, well, what parameters are being placed this time? You know, it just changes the way you see things. Then you start to th look at look at in chapter two. What did you what did you, what did you pick up in chapter two? Well, uh, don't just gloss over the phrasing that he's he where he created and made things that he rested from. Why why gloss over that? Don't do that. Why why gloss over the tree of life being mentioned in Genesis chapter two as just a tree, but yet in the promise to the church in Ephesus, you say it's Jesus. You will not have overcome his promise I give to you the part of the tree of life. How come in seminaries and in congregations, you're going to sit here and tell me tree of life in the, in the church letter to Ephesus that that's Jesus, but over in Genesis, it's not. Well, what is that? You deny much? Hypocrisy much? What's that about? I mean, just ask yourself the question, how does God use that same phrasing later? Right? And the knowledge of good and evil uh, of that tree, and you start seeing phrases into that, that reality. And what does knowledge do? that Paul said, knowledge puffs up. Isn't that what he said? And what, did, and what did Satan do when he was the author of sin? He was puffed up, arrogance. I shall ascend to the flanks of the north. That's what he said, right? And leaven puffs up. And leaven puffs up, and he sowed leaven. So you have this in scripture telling you that. So ask yourself those questions like, and why does Ezekiel 31 describe Satan as a tree? And why is the phrasing garden of God? And the other trees of Eden being mentioned in, Genesis, in Ezekiel 31. Why is that mentioned? Why would God write that? I, I'm just, why would he also call the Noetab that covereth? And in Ezekiel 28, he said that you were amongst the garden of God. He says it there too. It, it's, it's in the Bible later on. Why Isaiah 45 is he later on hide that gem of I didn't make things to be a void. I, cr I created this earth to be inhabited. So you got to ask yourself these questions and, and say forget what Church Andy says, forget what denominations say, forget what I used to believe. What is God saying in the holistic, ongoing teaching of his word? But you can't get to that holistic piece of it until you start with saying, the details matter, that I'm going to look for the hidden gems that are in open, plain sight, that God's hiding things. It's up to you to ask the questions. You know, why is this there? Remember, God does nothing by happen chance. Nothing's happen chance. The person he uses, the person he doesn't use, how he says it, when he says it, where he says it, what he does, how he does it. It's all important. Everything to God's important. He's a God of detail. Tremendous detail. If you don't believe that, look at the human body. Look at nature around you. <laughs> it, it, it is, look at the world history. It is complicated. It's not easy, right? And so you have a lot of these things that, that are just beyond the scope of just reading about stories. And later on, after he lays this template down, Abraham forward begins to forge now a difference of not just the dynamics of how to understand God and his intention for his purpose out ahead. He then delves into family dynamics about how we're to interact with each other from Abraham through Isaac through Jacob and of course Joseph. That story is fantastic. And he has to, and ends there, right? Then it goes into Moses. So the reality is Genesis continues to build that layer of understanding God from Genesis chapter 1 to Genesis chapter 12. He wants us to understand who he is, why he's doing what he's doing, what's out ahead, why it's important for us to know. But then from Genesis 12 onward, he takes that same truth, he's still adding, he's still doing that, still teaching us that, but now he's gonna add another layer. How should we live in love and consideration and compassion with each other? Starting with our families and dynamics of mother, father, husband, wife, brother, sister, all that stuff. And it doesn't get pretty. It gets ugly in those stories. <laughs> and so he, he, go, he does it. And this is the importance of the kingdom things or the secrets and mysteries. There's a lot of depth in the first 12 chapters. Is that depth 
kind of level off some. I mean, there's some, there's not as much packed into the next chapters that have ahead, but I would therefore also say the reverse is true. There's a lot more family dynamics going on from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's days and into Joseph. There's a ton more family dynamics ex ex extrapolated upon that God goes into depth on way more. He goes into family dynamics, relationship dynamics, way more than he does theology. But he does theology way more than he does relationship dynamics in that first 12 chapters. There's no doubt about it. So that's the reason why it's important to understand Genesis for, for what it's saying and, and who he's saying it to. And I hope this has been a, a, a prelude to just reminding ourselves why we're different, how we see things different. And for those who would say, okay, how do you believe differently? Give me an idea. And why is that important? And what does that mean to me today? And what's that ahead for the future? And so I hope I've touched on that. And that was the purpose of today. And the next time we meet should be Friday and it should be upstairs. <laughs> but I'll let you know. I'll, I'll stay tuned on that. I will let you know what I know. But that's the uh, plan. So let's close in, in prayer. Father, thank you for, again, this time and opportunity we've had to to, to study and to reflect and just to glean from your love and truth that you give to us in your word. Thank you for all the understandings of, of Genesis and the continual foundation that you lay that is so important for us to hear from the very beginnings. I can only imagine being Moses, being Moshe, being taught this by you, told to write this. I can't imagine how many times that he may have paused or had thought of pause and like, wow, what did you just say? Uh, and just to maybe have that interaction with you that it, it, no one will ever know what it was like to hear you say these words, to hear you speak this truth of spirit of, of life into him, to write this on these pages for us to see. Oh my goodness, wow. It's, it amazes me reading about it thousands of years later. I can only imagine how it felt for him also a couple thousand years after it happened to be told these things and to understand, oh, this is how we got to where we are. Oh, this is what you meant. Oh, this is what you're doing. This is why. And this is what you expect from us. And yet, for what's out ahead is still yet to be. And we have between now and then to continue to learn more of you, learn more of your word, and continue to serve and know you better, and to, uh, again, continue to be conformed to the image of you. So, Father, we thank you for all that you do provide for us and help us in this move. Uh, sustain and reach out to each one of us with your loving hand of kindness and give uh, Brother Lee restoration and continue good health and healing from his surgery and good health. Continue to be with all others in about the ministry that you know have a, a current immediate need at this time. And just thank you so much for also the, the coming soon, uh, new life in this world with Danielle. And bless that child and situation coming uh, and just every, everything around it. We thank you so much for all you do. In Jesus, Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. All right. I, I left home way early is that than normal. I, I got to tell you this story. I'm the sort of bandito. Oh. Well, I mean, if you have, I mean, um, what happened? Well, last week, you know, I was going to go in the Walmart.